going to expand again with Pizza Hayden coming back, people coming from Joburg all over. So exciting times and Anne-Marie, the Big Cat Week starts on the 26th of November until the 4th of December where we'll be doing a large amounts of live broadcasts, not only So exciting times for us. It's a very different product that we put out during those periods with a lot more inputs and feeds, two vehicles, a bushwalk, a drone, plus hidden in the safari tents. And with all those different inputs, it naturally changes the dynamic of the show quite a lot and we all enjoy it and find it quite exciting. So happy that it's happening soon and hopefully we'll get more and more of these high intensity shows because even for you guys I'm sure you enjoy the change of pace and scenery if you don't well sorry <laughs> at least you get a combination of the two though being able to watch on the internet and TV fresh these are. Look the awesome lion tracks here I'll show you quickly. It's not going to be easy in this flat overcast lights, but worth a try. There's the best one do you think Jim? None of them are clear. This one yeah in flat light like this it's very difficult to see tracks but there are some pug marks and toe marks. Here's the back pad of one there. There's one on the bottom corner here. You can also kind of see a few toes. So not easy, but a lion walk down here. It looks like a lioness. Possibly one of those young males that are from the Salada Pride. But we're going to send you back to James and try and decipher exactly how fresh these tracks are and who they belong to. See you later. Right, we've come to an area around uh, Vuyatel and Gallagher camps, which are the two camps at Juma. Uh, we left Vivalzog Dam, we didn't re-find that hyena who was scarpering off into the bushes. And we've had some squirrels alarm calling, and while it is not particularly bushy, uh, one of the ecologists does have a dog uh, at his home. And the dog is fitted with a... Well, I mean, the, the dog is basically alarm calling, it's barking at something. And the only reason that dog barks is if it sees a leopard. So we've come around here and we're just trying to see if we can see a leopard. Uh, um, perhaps Karula, she has been spending a lot of time in this area of late. We find her tracks, very difficult to get a vehicle in there, but it might be her. And then uh, Jamie has gone down the other side to have a look. She's not on drive, obviously, today, but she's out having a bit of a track. And so she's gone down the other side in the Mahindra to see if she can't spot something there. I can still hear the dog shouting. Now again, like I say, not a particularly wilderness sound, but um, well, I suppose you could consider it a wilderness sound if you consider people part of the part of the uh, part of the ecology of the area. And we've had dogs for many years. So we'll drive very gingerly through here. Let's see if we can't see the spots stalking stealthily through the bush. It sounds like you've had an absolutely marvelous birding time with Scott. I think that's excellent. I'm sad you didn't refine the uh, the Scops owl. Though. That was an astonishing find the other day. But nice to have canaries. Oh, you did find the Scops owl. That is excellent news. I can't believe it was still in the same tree. Maybe they've got a nest there. I always like those little canaries. I find them most entertaining to watch. Not easy to film, of course. Very 
difficult inquiry from Virginia in Kentucky. Um, it's a good question. Virginia, you want to know, does one species of bird understand the language of another species of bird? I'm going to just stop the car here and <coughs> just hear, see if I can hear anything alarm calling in this bush because this is where I think whatever is alarming those dogs is in here somewhere. So while I answer your question, Virginia, let's just keep an eye out on the bush there. Um, difficult if I'm not facing the bush, of course. There we go, that's better. <laughs> Virginia, I don't know for certain. Um, I, and I was actually talking about this between uh, some Impala and I think it was Nyala the other day, wondering if they could understand each other. No, it was, sorry, it was a zebra and a wildebeest. I think that there's, there are elements that they can understand for sure. Um, and I think you'll find with birds that the mimicry that there is with birds, you know how some birds can make the calls of other birds, has something to do with them communicating with each other in terms of saying, this is, my territory is full here, uh, go away, or, you know, territory is full here, don't come and try and find food because um, I've eaten it all, that sort of thing. I think various animals also react to each other in in the way that they they can respond to each other's alarm calls so definitely i'm sure uh, when a battus starts doing its alarm call or a rattling cesticula starts doing its alarm call i'm pretty sure that all the other birds in the area know precisely what that means i think some of the mammals know precisely what that means so yes i think there is a lot of intra or interspecific communication that goes on i think it's there even between things as different as birds and mammals there's definitely some understanding and i also think that there's quite a lot that happens on an energetic level that uh, might be termed a sort of um crassly if you like a, a esp or extrasensory perception i think they do communicate on an energetic level i think they they communicate on many levels that we as human beings with our totally visual and audio communication are unable to understand it as yet those gray luries are a little bit upset But the dog seems to have stopped. We'll do a little loop through here and then we'll go back out and around this block. Now what's interesting is that we've grown was looking at a uh, computer map the other day of the sightings that Karula's had over the years and her territory seems to be shrinking and we think that she's spending more and more time in this little piece of bush here. And that certainly would be borne out by the number of tracks we see going in here, the number of animals that we have alarm calling around here. To get a vehicle in there, you need a bulldozer. driving around here and we do sometimes, of course, a lot of you will hear when you are watching the Juma Dam Cam, you will hear the territorial calls of leopard or lion and Mike in Florida, you want to know, do animals go to specific areas in their territories where they think they might be heard uh, better? Yes, I think they do. Maybe not specific areas in their territories, but certainly um, they will use up here again. They will use things like um, drainage lines and specific times of day to make their, their calls go further. Lions will call in the dawn uh, just when the kind of moisture is lifting off the ground and they call, uh, they'll call along the ground so they'll often put their heads to the ground so that the sound does travel a bit further and um, they'll call in drainage lines because it then echoes out. Uh, leopard definitely do that, they'll get into a drainage line and it'll echo up through the trees. So yeah, I'm not sure specific areas in the territory necessarily, but certainly specific habitat types within the territory would definitely make them call. So I think we might be in here. Alright, 
can't hear anything further. Let's go around that way. Talk to Aubrey quickly on the radio. Um, Orbs confirmed that Dan uh, is on total. Just trying to find out what, what Aubrey said he was at a hyena den, I think. Is that on total? So there is a hyena den, but it is on Torchwood. It's not the same clan. That'll be a different clan of hyenas. And I think that the our little clan of hyenas, which we've so enjoyed over the years, well, in my case, over the months, but you've all enjoyed over the years, um, has a very clear territorial boundary just to the west of our eastern boundary. So we'll just do a gentle drive through here. Here comes the inimitable Jamie. She'll give us a little update. Uh, yeah, not, a, not a lot of space to get round here. I'll go in here. We'll allow Jamie to go past. Hello, Jamie. Let's shake hands like the men do, you know. Okay, there yes. we go. Very strong, manly, yes. manly thing to do. Thankfully, you are not manly. Um, here's Jamie, everyone. Hi. She's out tracking. And nothing, nothing. hey? Nothing. And Cara's sitting fine. She's perfectly relaxed. It's just all the bouncing okay. around. And I investigated earlier when they Those started. Those are the dogs, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, when they first started barking, I poked my head out and okay. there was nothing. nothing. And he was running from gate to back of house to gate to back ah, of house. Maybe he's hungry. <laughs> okay. All right. Good luck. Yes. As you were. Keep us posted. Um, will do. Mm. Anywhere in particular? I'm going to, to go to Treehouse Dam now. Okay. So roughly the only part of Juma I haven't checked today. Okay. <laughs> Okie dokie. See you now. All right. What side of the dash? Uh, yes, they're on Torchwood. No, not Torchwood. Chipper, chipper. Yeah. All right. All right. That's the um, that's the dogs Jamie was asking about. Oh well, no, let, um, let me before I totally confuse you. So she talked about the dog dogs, and then she asked where what no sign of the madash, which is a kind of um, slang term for for the wild dogs, and they are on Chitwa Chitwa at the moment, which is well to the south of us. So we're not going to see them today, unfortunately. Well, maybe this afternoon they might deign to grace us with their presence this afternoon. So let's head down to Treehouse Dam. We'll head in that direction via quarantine clearings and see what there is down there. There's a little bit of mud there and we saw yesterday a red-breasted swallow. I'm not sure which swallow that Scott showed you today but the red-breasted swallows are definitely in the process of making their mud nests. Quite astonishing constructions. Uh, they'll put them on overhangs of rocks or if you've got a, a ceiling or an eaves they'll often build there and I'm sure they do that in the States and in Europe as well and they build these amazing nests of mud safety tunnels and all sorts of things that make it hopefully safe for their little chicks later on in the season. Still, I've seen one yellow weaver this season and uh, none of them are, are building, none of them are uh, weaving their nests, maybe, and I think there are some traditional beliefs around this, um, maybe the weavers know something about the rain that we don't. Here are some beautiful nyala. A lovely little uh, occurrence. Young male. Very young male. We've had two difficult questions. Thank you, from Virginia and Kentucky about 
birds and whether they can understand each other and our virtual tourist in Texas you've hit me with one that I'm not sure I can answer for you you want to know why it is that Nyala males have got such different colorations from the females uh, they look like they're wearing funny socks uh, they certainly do um, and for those of you who perhaps don't know Tibbs is a more coming across the road if you want them um, that's a female there well that's my head in the bottom of the Friend. That's a female, and the males are grey. Now, the most sexually dimorphic mammals that I know of, and they're grey. And as virtual tourist point or uh, asks, why would there be different colours like that? Um, I don't know. Virtual tourist, I don't. I actually think the males are a better colour than the females, as I've asked many of you. And we, uh, well, together, I feel we failed to come up with a satisfactory answer as to why animals should be this rich chestnut red colour, which is so easy for our eyes to see in this bush. That grey colour of the male nyala is much more difficult to see in the bush. Um, and the so as for the socks, I don't know. So, I don't... Virtual tourist, this, my best answer is going to be a peacock's tail answer. Now, the peacock's tail, as uh, many of you know, is a totally useless and superfluous uh, appendage. It does not, in, it in fact places the peacock at risk. It places the peacock at risk, and it's, it's got longer and longer over evolutionary time because females select peacocks for their long tails. So the longer the tail is, the more the greater the selective pressure will be to have a longer tail and that's why the tails have got so much longer over evolutionary time and the question as to why that is the case uh, is begged and we think it might have something to do with the fact that because a long tail um, is a predicator of uh, of health and it's a predic predictor of health because it's such a it's such a hindrance to survival that if you have a long tail uh, it proves that you're able to live in the long uh, that you're able to survive the conditions and survive in adverse conditions um, even though you're hindered by this tail so your genes are so good that you're able to survive and I wonder if there isn't some mechanism like that that has moved inside the Nyala population that has resulted in them having this kind of strange uh, coloration and, and strange, uh, very shaggy coats. Maybe the shagginess of the coat is some kind of peacock's tail. I don't know. Very interesting question. Uh, virtual tourist in Texas, I shall keep thinking about it. And anybody else who has any ideas, please, I'd love to hear them. I normally find that somebody who's watching us has a very brilliant idea and a light bulb moment ensues. Now, Diane, thank you very much for your compliment. You say we've given you a nice birding safari. I'm very glad you've enjoyed it. I feel that's, uh, that's more the birthday boy than me, but thank you very much, Diane. And Anna Marie, you want to know along the lines of a birding safari, uh, what kind of a, uh, do we get quilias here? Um, for those of you who don't know, a quilia is a finch-like bird or sparrow-like bird that occur in great volumes, and specifically in Zimbabwe, um, you will get flocks of millions of quilia birds and they're the bane of farmers' lives. They eat crops like waves of locusts and I'll find you a picture of one here. In Anna Marie, we absolutely do get them here. Not in anything like the numbers that they would in Zimbabwe, but we do get them for sure. There's the red-billed quilia there. That's him. And we get there you kind of a vaguely pretty poor illustration of this flocks that they make but that is the red billed quilia and i've seen a few this season they they're nomadic rather than um rather than what we'd call migratory so they don't go to specific places 
but they do occur in, a, in an area and then disappear completely so then they're, they're quite nomadic and what they eat is grass seeds so when the summer comes when the summer gets a bit later say January and February and the the grass seeds are up on the culms then you'll find they'll come through not in those enormous numbers but we do get some pretty good sized flocks here wonderful to see them flying not so great if you happen to be a, a farmer and they I mean I was talking earlier on about the um, about how animals we think or I think communicate on levels that we don't really understand and if you watch quelia birds flying in a flock of a million and much the same as those flocks of starlings you get in Europe and I think in North America or a bait ball of fish and um, they don't crash into each other, but the flock almost moves like one organism, making these incredible shapes and turns in the air. We have no idea how on earth they do that. And there will be various crackpots who will tell you, well, I mean, I, my theory is probably quite crackpot too, but, you know, they'll tell you that they've got sensors on their wings maybe, or that they, you know, they communicate very fast in between each other, but nobody can come up with how a million birds can turn in the same direction without any kind of vocal communication whatsoever. It is one of the great mysteries to me of, uh, of the natural world. And I'm sure that they are communicating on a level we don't understand. Right, quarantine clearings. This is a pretty devoid of animals at the moment. And I think that that is because there's no grass on it. And there's no grass on it because it was the last grass. Just looking here, possible tracks. Lots of hyena tracks. Uh, very cleverly, uh, Anna Marie and Diane, you'll be pleased to know, Scott has managed to find some bee eaters at Arathusa Dam, I'm assuming, and I will see you just now. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've been having fun with James. I have no doubt you have. I'm just trying to work out where a large flock of European bee eaters have flown off to. They were kind of dotted around in all these trees to our right and then they simultaneously, a lot of them took off and flew high into the sky and far away. And it's the bird that Siberia Zumi was apparently hearing at the Arethusa waterhole. When we got there about five minutes ago, there were no bee eaters in sight and we couldn't hear any either. And as soon as we found them here, they've sadly all flown off. And I cannot hear them anymore, which means just bad luck, I guess. Our timing was off, not a problem though as they are going to be here for a long time and it's going to take us quite some time to actually get you good views of them. They're tricky birds to get close to. They're usually not very easy to film. They like to stay far away from the vehicles or fly very high up in the sky. Beautiful colorations and markings though. So something to look forward to. But it's not going to be easy to get you the perfect bee eater shots. Maybe they're heading back towards the Arethusa waterhole, Siberia Zumi, so keep listening for them. Their call kind of brings out. <coughs> tiny little. Brits, usually from high up in the sky. Oh. This is one of my favorite areas of Arethusa to drive through. We're on the southern and now western boundary, so just about as far away as we could possibly be from Juma. I 
notice the roads are a little bit bumpy, like now. And Judith would like to know, is there someone who maintains these roads that drag something along them to keep them smooth? And yes, there is. On some properties, the roads are maintained better than others. And it will all depend on the landowners. At one camp where I used to work, the roads were incredibly well looked after, which makes more an easier safari experience, especially when you've got guests on the back. The front row is the most comfortable. So remember this when out of safari, because most people, and I'm not sure what it is, but they've got the idea that sitting at the back, so everybody kind of tries to track where it's the way to be because it's the most bouncy of all the seats. Anyway, there is somebody that maintains these roads. Um, heavy, heavy rains that we didn't get last summer and that we're probably not going to get this summer either. But so we'll usually wash the roads away. And that's why there are often actually these big mounds that we go over that are almost like a speed bump. And that's to prevent water from gaining momentum and eroding the roads at a high speed. I'll show you one. Oh, this is a little bump we're going over and then there's a little kind of drainway that runs off over there. So it's kind of a natural, not a natural, it's a man-made gutter for trying to prevent rains eroding the roads, but it's a constant job. Anyway, we're going to send you across to James, who is in a better signal area than me. A lilac breasted roller on the theme of the birding safari that uh, Scott has begun and um, seemingly doing a very successful job at are the problems with Wendy and what I'm hoping that lilac breasted roller is going to do which it therefore inevitably is not going to do is fly up and give you the display which shows why it's called a lilac breasted roller but it does this amazing acrobatic display and that's why they're called rollers it's called lilac breasted, of course, because it has a, a lilac breast. Beautiful, beautiful bird. And interestingly, again, now here's another interesting one for you. Why on earth does that bird have male and females of the same bright colors? So how on earth, we know, we, we think we know why it is that, say, the sunbirds have got birds or males that are different colors from the females. We think those bright colors are definitely like a peacock's tail that it helped them to attract females. But why would you be such a brightly colored bird, male and female, when you both look almost completely the same? So I don't think it's an attraction thing, but why be that color? I think it's fascinating. And I'm just going to sneak backwards here. There's a bird and a tree behind us there. Oops. I'm just going to roll slowly back on the marula tree there. It's hopping in the branches. Oh, come on, Jigger. Uh, these, old, these old cars, I tell you, the wheels barely turn anymore. There's a lovely bird hopping on the marula tree here. It looks like a crystal bob. You can get them in the light, they're just spectacular. Lots of bird activity going on here. Uh, can't see anymore. I think it was a crystal bar. It was beautiful orange and black and yellow and white. Uh, very scruffy there. Right, let's go to Tree Out Down and see what's going on there. Hopefully those red-breasted swallows will be back collecting mud. And maybe there'll be a pride of lions lying on the damn wall. You just never know. Thankfully, 
here we have a great saviour of the intellect. Monica, thank you. You say that the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park says that prey species are that red colour because their predators don't see it. They see it as green. Now, this dovetails with something that Brian said to me the other day. And, well, I mean, we, we know that animal, the, pre, pre, the predators don't see in color, but they don't see in black and white. So they see a variation of colors, and it's probably a question uh, Brian had said, to, said it to me the other day. I think it's, it's variations of blue and yellow, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so that green and red color will look the same possibly to the predators as so that reddish color in the bush like this will look almost invisible there we, there we go thank you Monica I think you've solved the mystery to me and it makes perfect sense and what you can do what we're going to try and do and uh, we'll try and manipulate a, a bit of footage say with of a um, an impala or a nyala with a green background and we'll pull different colors out of it and see if we can make it disappear in the background. So I think that's, that'll probably be a good idea for us to do with some footage when, we, when, we've got, when we've got some footage of a Impala on a green background. Thank you, Monica. You've solved the mystery for me. Hooray. Also, of course, as the rain, it gets a little bit wetter, we've had the millipedes out, the myriapoda or the shongololos as they call in South Africa, and they're astonishing creatures, very ancient order of, very ancient class actually of invertebrates, so animals without backbones. And Julia, you want to know what they eat. They eat bits and pieces of vegetation, fungus. Uh, I think some of them may be a little bit predatory, but I think they're no, they're not. They're, they're, I think, as far as I know, they're almost entirely vegetarian. But they'll eat fungus and they'll eat some pieces of the different kinds of vegetation. I think they have to be fairly unfussy because they can't move very far, of course, or very fast. There is absolutely nothing going on here. We'll go around onto the dam wall. <laughs> and all the way from the freezing cold reaches of Alaska Heather, I'm sure it's getting pretty chilly there. I've never been to Alaska. And as far as I'm aware, Alaska has the largest national park in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Heather, you want to know how many colors there are on a lilac-breasted roller? As far as I remember, there have been seven colors counted on the body of a lilac-breasted roller. Now, the red-breasted swallow is here. That's him there, Tibbs. And let's just see if he doesn't come down. Oh, there's a yellow weaver! Second one of the season. Disappeared into this tree here. Okay, I'm going to leave the swallow for now because it's flying around and it will make you nauseous if you try and follow the camera. Now, in this tree, Tibbs, up in front of us here, there is a yellow weaver bird and I want to see if we can't get him on camera. There, I can hear him calling. Zzz, zzz, zzz. Stop, I'll let you listen to him. There, that is. There we go. Still no fresh nest building activity. I'll sneak a little bit forward. Let's try and get a look. They're very beautiful birds. Oh, you got him. You got him, Tibbs. Well done. I'm going to sneak a bit forward. Let's see if we can't pick him 
Jakarta. Now I'll go on silent, of course, because he knows we're having a look. Let's go down here. Yeah. Tips. He's kind of halfway up the main trunk, hopping around in there. There you got him, well done. Right, everybody, that is the southern, no, it's not the southern mouse, I think that's a village weaver, and with a black face, and in winter, totally drab brown bird and that one is now coming to full breeding plumage every year they change into that beautiful yellow color and they make the nests that are so iconic and um, I'm not going to get tips to show you just now once we've stopped looking at the bird I'll show you the old nests but I think what he's trying to do now is attract some females and I've seen them in this tree before but I think they haven't started building because we haven't had much rain and I remember I, I forget which hang on one second I'll get back to you now Jamie's just hailing me on the radio go Jamie go ahead no negative Copy that, thanks. Um, Jamie is, is not too far from Gowrie Dam following a drag mark that she threw. So we'll go in that direction and help her once we've discussed this magnificent weaver. Um, we had a viewer once who said that the weavers do predict, or that she'd heard that the weavers do predict um, whether there's going to be a wet year or not. And it is very much dependent on um, but you can tell from where they, they build their, their nests. I forget where, what it was. If you look over there, you can see the, the, the nests are on the outside of the tree and that either meant a, a year of high rain or low rain. I'm not sure which, and if they were closer in, then it would be the opposite. So you can see there, those old nests, they haven't been, well, they won't be reconstituted, but there's absolutely no new building going on here which I think is quite telling. Right, that is the village weaver, very magnificent weaver. The sun is out, it's starting to heat up a, a bit. So let's go and have a quick look at where Jamie is. We'll just go and give her a hand there. And on we go. No rush. I'm so pleased, Rebecca, in Santa Barbara, that you are enjoying our little birding safari. Um, it is great fun, I must say, I really love it. And it is, uh, it's, they're all around us, these birds, and we do sometimes tend to get a little bit obsessed, I feel, with the big aries, as they say. That is the call of the orange-breasted bushwife. Now, the birders are out, ornithologists are out in force today. Deb in Kentucky, you seem to be a bit of a fan of the sparrow. Uh, we get three sparrows here. I think I may have just found you one. Uh, Tebs, before you start swinging that camera around, uh, let me make sure that I'm not talking nonsense. Um, <laughs> Deb, you want a, it's not a sparrow, and that's disappeared. You want a grey-headed sparrow, which is a pretty common, 
you want a yellow-throated sparrow, which isn't called a sparrow anymore, and for the life of me I can't remember its name, but I'll find out for you now. And, or a house sparrow. House sparrow I haven't seen here, you know, which is probably a good thing. Passer domesticus. Uh, they are, of course, imported from the United Kingdom. They don't really belong here. I suppose you might say the same of me, uh, or my ancestors. But we don't see too many too many house sparrows are out, he out here in the cities, absolutely. But the grey-headed sparrow is common and the yellow-throated sparrow is not common. I have seen one here. And I'll find you a picture of uh, or the name of him now. To really get up close and personal with it. Yellow-throated petronia. Why it is now called a petronia and no longer a sparrow? Well, that's beyond my ornithological knowledge. Sunbirds are out calling. There's a mm, mm, yellow or white, sorry, white bellied sunbird I've just spotted. Tabs just right in the top of this tree here. Can you see it there? You see that little white thing in the tree there? In that, uh, yeah, in that tree. If you go to the very top of that tree, keep going. That's it. You got him. Just to the right of that, there you go. That is a white-bellied sunbird. So that's another one for the list today, but <laughs> I mean, unless you've got a Hubble Space Telescope sized lens on the end of your camera, uh, seeing them you've got to get pretty close. And then also here, over there, So that is a black cuckoo calling thing. That's so sad. What? There it is. There's, can you see some spider on the oh, I can see it here. No, sorry everybody, there's some spider webs. Still there. Still there. Um, go on? Yeah, go on. Okay, so what that is, is it's ballooning, ballooning young spiders, spiderlings. I love the term spiderling, I think it makes, um, it somehow could be arachnophobe. I'm sure that the word spiderling is far less uh, terrifying than the word spider. And what they do, all, there's lots of silk all over the place. You find yourself driving along and then you do that and you come with a hand, come away with a handful of silk. And what that is, is the spiderlings ballooning off and they sit on the end of the trees and they send out a little strand of silk with their spinnerets and eventually that strand gets long enough for them to lift off and they fly off ballooning away and eventually they'll find a place to start a, a web of their own or dig a hole of their own or do whatever strategy it is that they, that they use to eat. So we were looking at that yellow weaver which excited me greatly. Um, and Jenny, you want to know the males arrive before the females to get the nest ready? They do. The males spend a lot of time getting the nest ready because that's how they attract the females. A little bit like with human beings, um, the female weaver wants to know that her babies are going to be uh, secure and so she in does a thorough inspection of her potential home and the home of a clutch of chicks. And then she makes a decision on whether she will acquiesce to mating with the male and having his offspring. So that is exactly how it goes. So I suspect that male, he's quite, well, I mean, he's not early for the season, but he's early on the tree, and he will now start to fall with any luck.
thank you Mary for your little anecdote that is really very valuable out here. Mary, you say that your father was colorblind and he couldn't see the difference between red and green and he'd go into the garden and pick green tomatoes instead of red ones which must have frustrated your mother, no, no, du no doubt. Um, thank you for that, there it is. So that red, rich, russet color that we find on Impala and Nyala and indeed one of our directors is explained now. So it's obviously invisible to the uh, predators that don't see in color. Uh, Sharon, you've said I have a, a sharp sense of humor. Thank you very much. Um, some people find it a little too sharp, uh, but uh, I'm glad you don't. And you say, what is, the, um, what is the funniest thing that I've ever seen an animal do? I don't know what sticks out in my mind. Um, my father used to own a totally ridiculous animal called Trubshaw. And Trubshaw was a Staffordshire Bull Terrier and quite possibly the dumbest animal to ever have graced the earth and he was a walking comedy show he did the most astonishing the amusing things um, from lying on his back in the sun with all four legs in the air uh, with his mouth open and tongue lolling out he was always very amusing to watch then he'd come and sit my father was having his tea in the afternoon and it was near walk time Trubshaw would come and put his stare at my father like this and then if my dad didn't get up with sufficient uh, vigor he'd, uh, he'd take my father's hand and start to drag him and then he'd start to bite uh, so that was quite funny out here i think uh the, you know the lions the lions because they are supposed to be these great noble creatures i always find it quite amusing when they behave in totally slothful fashion they much like trubshaw used to do their when they lie down like that and open their, all the, you know, they put everything on display. I find it tremendously amusing because we think of them as being such noble creatures. Um, and then in terms of just general amusement, watching something like a squirrel or a, a dwarf mongoose and watching their little antics and activities, that's always quite funny too. So lots of funny things that go on out here. And I'll try and think of something. I mean, of course, the funniest, the funniest creature out here in the bush is at Wild Earth, of course, is, uh, is the staff. The staff members are generally the most amusing things that we, that we spend time with. Um, everybody has their own quirks. I'm certainly taking a game drive with, with the VM or Andrew is likely to result in a very sore stomach afterwards because they are just very funny people. So, I'm not often not intentional. So, yeah. I will keep thinking about that because I do seem to laugh quite a lot at animals. Ooh. And uh, yet another unanswerable inquiry. Um, about the spoonbill. Judy, you were watching with us the spoonbill in the Bifflesworth Dam and you want to know, is there, does it have an adaptation that stops it getting dizzy? Um, Judy, I, I don't know of one and I mean for those of you who didn't see it, they feed by moving their head from side to side like that continuously. I imagine that the brain is probably fairly well protected um, but I think a little bit like a an ice skater or a dancer who is used to spinning around, you know, your brain gets used to it, so you don't get dizzy. I mean, those ice skaters who spin and spin and spin and then don't fall over uh, have always astounded me. I can't turn around three times without wanting to fall over. And I suspect that all the spoonbill is is used to moving its head from side to side like that. And I think that's why it doesn't get dizzy. 
would be my guess. Question from Rick and Susie in Washington State and why, Rick and Susie, you are not in Hawaii anymore unless you're a different Rick and Susie, which I find very uh, unlikely. Um, please let us know why you're not in Hawaii anymore. And I am still looking for your lilac breasted roller feather. Please, please uh, be, do not worry about that. Uh, you want to know if the spoonbill, African spoonbill, is this related to the roseate spoonbill? Just have a quick look at these young male Nyala, lots of them there. We're now into the area where Jamie was, where she found that drag mark. Um, Rick and Susie, I imagine they are, probably in the same family, maybe the same genus, but they're definitely not the same species, obviously. I think they are certainly related. Yeah, they've come out into the sun, these Nyala, and they're not grazing, they are browsing on sort of very short herbaceous plants that are not grasses. So forbs, flowering plants. And I suspect they're probably quite aromatic and I suspect also that they wouldn't be able to eat them all the time. Because there will definitely be some kind of chemical um, protection in those plants that means that they're not eaten totally flat. We had an interesting question yesterday about what, if there are any poisonous plants out here that animals are affected by. And I think one of the most interesting things about that question was that the animals out here definitely can cope with things that would poison us. So I know kudu can eat euphorbia. We don't get too much euphorbia here, but uh, black rhino and porcupines will very happily eat tamburti, which is deadly for human beings. And I think that those, you find that those plants that they're eating are very aromatic and poss possibly it's, it's as, as is the case everywhere out here, there's a, an evolutionary arms race going on where there'll be a certain level of chemical protection in the plants that is slightly toxic, but the Nyala will have coped to deal with that for now. Okay, let's drive along the damn wall here. No yellow weavers here yet. Many old nests. Um, we're talking about weavers and with Swayze you want to know how many nests a male village weaver will make during the course of a season. Rick, um, ideally just one, but they will make more than that if the, what the female does if she rejects the nest she'll then tear it to pieces and he will start again. So if he does it right, I suspect he only makes one nest. If he does it wrong, I suspect he keeps building until he gets it right. They take a long time to build, so they don't want to be building too many. Now apparently, Jamie said she had a drag mark going into this block here. And she had a hyena that was helping her follow it. I wonder if that's not the hyena we had in Buffers of Dam. It was coming directly in this direction. Oh, there's a beautiful virtual starling. Let's have a look at him while we wait and see. You can hear one of my favorite summer birds, the red-chested cuckoo going. Obviously it's stopped now. And there is the, so that's the virtual starling. And that's the starling without the yellow eye. There he goes. 
The other starlings have got, well, the other glossy starlings have got yellow eyes. Two ye uh, glossy starlings that we get, the greater blue-eared glossy starling and the cape glossy starling. And unless you see them in really good light, the only way to differentiate them is from the core, which I'm not very good at making. Let's go around the corner here. Unrelated to the birds, Teresa, you want to know if I lived in Toronto. Um, I'm assuming you are in Toronto. Uh, Teresa, no, I've never lived in Toronto. I do have cousins who live in Toronto, though. Uh, I've seen them for many, many years. But I do have some cousins who live there. I have no question in my mind that Toronto is well too cold for someone like me. I get miserable if the temperature ever drops below 10 degrees here. It's a really beautiful morning. The clouds are big, white and puffy and they're diffusing the light really nicely. And I'm told that it is 19 degrees uh, Celsius and 65 Fahrenheit. That sounds about right. So now this is a chilly wind which probably drops the temperature slightly but it's about right. drainage line down here to have a look and she thinks it's probably a hyena I think that given the number of hyena we've seen knocking about today that's quite possible I'm going to turn around here because our signal will disappear if we carry on up this road and it's not worth trying unless there's a truly magnificent sighting up there which um, there isn't at the moment Just head off a little bit into the centre of the reserve to the thickish bush. Oh, I wanted to tell you, um, I was hoping to see Mbula. My hopes have been dashed again. He's on torchwood. He is okay. He's fine. He's having a sleep under the bush apparently, very soundly. Uh, unfortunately, we can't go and see him because he is there. In Ghana's tracks we have not seen for a while since his mating. I think he's gone into hiding. Karula, I think, is around here somewhere. No tracks yet, but I'm sure she's come back here and she'll wait out to see whether she's fallen pregnant or not. Now, when I say wait out to see, I don't mean in a, in a conscious way. Uh, she will, her physiology will tell her. And if she isn't pregnant, she'll come into East pretty soon again, I think. As the sun comes out, so do the flies. I see young Tebs, who's just joined us, has not uh, learnt the joys of the buff yet. I like it. Many of the cameramen wear these buffs over their faces to keep the flies off them. So Tebs is going to be inundated just now. Let's stop and listen here. And we're listening to the call of the orange-breasted bushrike. It's just beautiful. Janine, you want to know if um, Tebs replaced anyone? No, Tebs didn't replace anyone. We just uh, needed to expand the team, especially with Big Cat Week coming up, which was very exciting. So Tebs is on board uh, to help us out to the end of the year, I think.
tips. And, yep, to the end of the year. And who knows after that? Beautiful sounds of what is now turning into the mid-morning. Ooh. Hibs, I'm going to really challenge you now. I don't know if you can see. I'm going to sneak forward very slightly for you. There's a Franklin snoozing in a tree there. It shouldn't be doing because it's a ground-dwelling bird. You can see it there. <coughs> and if I didn't know that they nested on the ground, I'd say it was on a nest. You can see it in there. Um, now just keep zooming in there. There you got him. Look at that. There's a crested Franklin. And also, sorry, I was talking nonsense earlier. You've got, we've got a white-browed scrub robin calling and an orange-breasted bush right. Right, that's enough nonsense from me before I make another mistake. Let's said, send you back to Scott, freshly aged 30, and some bee eaters. Now, it's not very close, but on the... Oh, there it goes. Well done, Viam. It's the European bee eaters we've been looking for all morning. And... There's a few of them fluttering around here. Let's creep forward a little bit and see if it doesn't open up a few more view options. There's more than one here, but they're incredibly quick birds. Don't stay seated for too long, at least not close to the vehicles. They're cousins, the carmine bee eaters. Oh, well done, VM. It landed on this dead tree. Let me just jiggle the vehicle ever so slightly. Let's see if it doesn't pop into a gap. Is it there? Oh, yeah, I think right on top, but one may have landed as well. So you can see. Can you get? Yeah, yeah, there we go. There's two of them, not very close, but these are the European bee eaters we've been looking for. Now, they, that's them calling. I was just about to say they haven't been very vocal, but that drip, 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 drip was them. And they're typically more vocal when they're flying, and they often fly in large locks. I think you're back with us, everyone. Ooh, watch out. Large tree. I think you lost signal with Wendy, so you're with us. Uh, welcome back again, of course. You know, we have found, uh, continued to find nothing. But we are going to hopefully find a few more birds. I've given up on the mammals. They clearly decided that Juma is not a place they wish to be today. Although we've seen some quite nice general game. The old Nyala, the old Impala. See what else we can find along this road in the middle of the reserve. I think we're going to do this. We'll do Hyena Road again, which is this road here. No, we won't. We'll do Vultures Nest Road. We haven't done that today. Maybe we'll be lucky with something there. Like I say, quite apart from the. Uh, back of animals, if you like. It has been a very beautiful morning and continues to be, so it's really just pleasant driving around and being out here. Hopefully a bird or two. Keep us going, sustained for the rest of the drive. We also do, we do love to hear from you when you say, when you tell us what kind of birds you'd like to see. So, we're looking for sparrows and anybody else who would like to see a specific kind of bird. Obviously the Andean condor or something like that is going to be impossible for us to show you. But there's uh, something vaguely on our bird list and we can keep a look out for it. It's always nice to know what people are looking for. Uh, so 
Rick and Susie who lived in Hawaii. I'm not sure why anybody would ever leave Hawaii, but you say that the Pacific Northwest of Washington State has its own beauties, and your next stop will be sunny South Africa. Well, that's an excellent idea, of course. Uh, I believe it's quite rainy in Washington State. Uh, certainly could use some of that here now. Probably here as we drive down here, the um, sound of the cicadas falling. So we'll head down towards the drainage line or dry riverbed. I really, apparently, I need to get the word drainage line out of my vocabulary. There's a dry riverbed in front of us. We'll try and go down there and see. Birding-wise, it's always very good down in them, and perhaps something else will be seeking shelter. There's also, there is around here a gymnogene or African harrier hawk nest there. Dash. I disturbed it. There's its nest. You see it lives in the fork of this tree here. I'll sneak forward for you. You can just see in the fork of this big tree up here. I'll just park next to it and then we can go. And there is the nest of the African Harrier Hawk, just up there. just see a pile of sticks in the middle of the fork of the tree. It looks like an extremely scruffy place and not very comfortable for the young chick when it's born. Right, let's ease our way. There you go. You can see it just looks like um, somebody has uh, dumped a load of kindling in the top of the tree. I'm pretty sure that those gym gene are, if they haven't yet, will be sitting on a clutch of eggs because they're in that tree every time we come past. It's a beautiful torchwood tree or green thorn and they're in here all the time at the moment. Uh, I don't know if you can hear those birds going just in front of us there. It's where that gymnogene's landed. They're all alarm calling at it. They're not very happy. You might also find something else for Ted to eat, of course. We gave him some fairly unpleasant tasting food yesterday, some Bushman's grape, maybe find something slightly tastier. And I'm not going to be able to see it. How many questions? <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Suddenly got <coughs> a herd of frogs in my throat. Um, Miss Lynn, while we're driving along, you want to know how far we drive during the course of a drive. Uh, it depends entirely, <coughs> obviously, on the drive. If we find lions on quarantine clearings or a leopard just outside of camp, we might not drive even a mile. But now, on a day like today, when we are searching frantically for different things, I think we've been three hours, we probably do about 20 kilometers, you know, about 12 or 13 miles. That's probably what we drive on a day like today. And yeah, so I'd say that's, that's almost a maximum number of miles that we drive. So I've hardly stopped the car today at all, because there hasn't been a sort of established sighting. So about 20 miles on it, or 13 miles on a day like today, I'd say the average is probably sits at around half of that six. We've got Jamie on the radio. Go ahead. Um, 
So Jamie's been following the drag mark of that hyena. Probably thank you. And she found it. She found where it started, hoping that there would be a leopard sitting in a tree, looking upset that it had lost its meal. But unfortunately not. Now that came from a totally different direction from that uh, hyena we saw this morning, who was carrying a nyala in her mouth. So I don't know where or what was going on where Jamie was around. done a full circle now we're coming towards twin dams where we began our little adventure this morning here the orange breasted bush right calling so seldom actually see them in this bush. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Just listen to that. Listen to that. <laughs> so we had the first movement this morning, the explosive first movement of the symphony. We moved into the second movement, which was a bit quieter. Having a short burst of the third movement now. Starlings. You can hear the flutes going crazy. I just wish we could get a view of him because he's so beautiful. We're going to drive around this bush, especially in the absence of large game. Just keep an eye out. There, there they are. Oh man. Can you see them, Tibbs? Look, there's the orange breasted bush right. Now let's see if I can make him call again. being fooled by me. Let's sneak back around. I'm glad you saw it though. No, I can't see it now. I think they've flown off. So you can definitely, you can definitely see there a male trying to woo a female with his beautiful song, and he looked like he was doing pretty well. Had a little companion. Maybe they're about to produce some smaller orange-breasted bush shrikes. I mean, I asked for a quest on the bird list and uh, you've hit me with some pretty difficult ones. Nancy in Minnesota, uh, a secretary bird or a quarry busted. Uh, yes, good ones. Both are findable here. Quarry busted, probably rarer. Secretary bird we definitely ha have seen a few times here. Um, and then Jean in Los Angeles, I think you are. Mistaken. You want to see an African ground hornbill. Now that is a highly endangered black turkey. And as you guys head towards Thanksgiving, and give a thought to the ground hornbill.
not that you'll be, I think they'd make appalling eating. But, um, certainly they are an endangered species out here. A huge big black turkey-like creature, well with a huge chisel-like bill on the end of his head. Two more requests, one that I don't think I'm going to be able to fulfill, and the other that I know I'm not. Barbara in Texas, you want to see hummingbirds. I'm afraid you're going to have to get in a plane and head, um, well, no, you'll probably find them at home, uh, or head south into the Amazon for the best hummingbird viewing. Uh, you definitely, I know, I've seen hummingbirds in North Carolina before. So I think you get them in the States, quite, quite a few of them. We don't get hum hummingbirds here. Our evolutionary equivalent is like that um, sunbird that I showed you earlier, the white-bellied sunbird. We get four species of sunbird out here, and very colorful, long bill. They don't hover like the hum hummingbirds do, but they drink nectar. They've got those probing beaks for drinking nectar, just like the hummingbirds do. And then a request for a woodland kingfisher from Mary Ann and woodland kingfishers should be back now. There was a report of one in Footstraight the other day. We did have a vague report that one was seen the other day on, a, uh, on the Juma Dam cam, but I'm suspicious of it because they haven't called yet. And I don't know why they'd be here and not call. So I don't know where the woodland kingfishers are. Maybe like the weavers, they know something that we don't. Hopefully, well, maybe. There is a, not a wooden kingfisher, sorry. Uh, this is a highly mobile European bee eater. I think Scott did show you a European bee eater. Ooh, there's one right here. Right. Beautiful colors, amazing colors. Oh, you beastly bird. Sorry about that, everyone. He's flown off. And the bird you can hear going... Southern boo-boo. A shrike. Of sorts. It's getting quite warm. continues to be very magnificently diffused by the puffy white clouds. And the mammals continue to elude us completely. I bet Scott's regretting leaving those elephants this morning. during the day, often happens. I decided not to do this on air, but Stefan, Scott and I had a wonderful walk yesterday evening and we found the nest of a thing called a polyrhynchus ant and it's a fairly nondescript ant, a black ant like that with a, um, a large abdomen, it doesn't bite it makes quite an interesting nest 
uh, looks like a sort of almost like a termite mark, a small termite mark under the ground. But the interesting thing about the polyrhynchus ant is that its abdomen tastes like a lemon drop and like a, literally a, a drop of sweet lemon juice. <laughs> and um, I was prevailed upon to test this, this art and so unfortunately for the hapless ant I did uh, in fact eat it. Uh, it was the most amazing taste. To pick up a, a black ant and suck out its inside, which I wouldn't consider doing on a normal day, it was the most astonishing taste. So if we can find one of those, I might have to give it to Ted so that he can try that out. Very delicious. He wouldn't know. And he's shaking his head with great vigor. Right, well there's a mammal, fairly large one, biggest we can get. He's coming down the road in what it can only be described as the must swagger. You see that swagger that he's got? What I'm going to do is just move out of his way and let him come. I think you'll find... We'll just let's just get an idea of what he's doing. When the elephants come down the road with that kind of swagger. You just want to step out of their way. I'm watching him carefully. He's still coming this way. I'm just going to move a little bit back to give him some space. No, he seems to have stopped. I think he's listening to us quite carefully. Here he comes. Come out here, Tibbs. There we go. Beautiful elephant bull. might not be doing the swagger. No, he doesn't look well. He's got a little bit of moisture on his inner leg. It's just, we'll, we'll stay with him. Um, a bit of moisture on the on the inside of his back leg, indicating that he might have what that we call that green penis syndrome, where he drips urine almost continually. Uh, when they're in that state of must, which is their time of mating. But there's the way he was walking down the road, that kind of swagger that they have when they're in must. It just says, don't get in my way, I'm feeling irritated. Let him walk quietly there. Lisa, you've noticed that it has been windy and there have been huge changes in the lion dynamics and could that be putting pressure on the elephants? Uh, Lisa, no. No, I don't think either of those three things are related at all. I think the elephants have actually been remarkably calm. Um, I think they're completely calm at the moment. This elephant is, you know, I can see he's a little irritated, but he's certainly not in the least bit aggressive. He just is, would appreciate and probably not uh, followed too closely. So we'll follow him down the road. I don't think that those three things are related. I don't think the wind is the area has had anything to do with the line dynamics at all. We'd be able to smell if he was a musk now. And a very distinctive kind of sweet, spicy scent to them when they're a musk. There we go, the beautiful big bull rat. A bit of a mission if he doesn't uh, know of a section of plants that he wants to go and eat. Following him. 
down the road a bit. very difficult for tips because every time we stop we level the camera he goes behind a bush and we have to move again There he comes through the bush there. Alright, I think we're going to let him disappear into the bush quietly. Um, oh, I don't know that he's going to let us carry on with him. Uh, just a few minutes left of show. Um, and because we haven't seen a huge in the way, amount in the way of animals, um, a quicker shout out to Scott for his birthday and perhaps a small birthday song. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Mr. Scott, you are old just like me. There we go, that will be Scott's birthday present for the day. Thank you all very much for your questions and contributions. Um, on a quiet day like this, it's always so lovely to have your different questions and uh, thoughtful, thought-provoking comments. So thank you very much for those. Thank you, uh, Ted, for your efforts today. And um, we're going to hand you back to Scott now uh, after saying a quick thanks to Jerry and Nikki and Tara in the final control. And please wish Scott my very best. We'll see you this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Bye-bye and see you later. What a beautiful day it is here and thank you so much everyone including James for the kind birthday wishes. I really really do appreciate it so much and look forward to enjoying the rest of the day out here. It should be a good afternoon. It's heating up quite a lot now and there's a lot of clouds building in the south. So I'm not sure if it's going to be hot, if it's going to be raining, what's going to be going on. But either way, I'm sure we're going to have a good safari this afternoon and look forward to spending it with all of you. Again, thanks again. And I'm just going to let you now take a look at these beautiful clouds for the last few seconds of the show. And we'll see you all a bit later.